part two of our Acts 12 message with verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That phrase should follow every adverse situation in life. But the church was earnestly praying for him or her or it. Last time I gave four examples right from this church community of but the church was earnestly praying for them. And, and individually I gave two examples. And today Helga was supposed to come up and tell us three stories. Three stories. And I don't quite remember them well enough to tell them. Apparently her hip is really bad this morning and she's so disappointed she couldn't be here. But I know one of them was a son with leukemia, diagnosed with leukemia, but the church prayed in earnest for him and the leukemia was gone. Without treatment, it was gone. Another was a very, very, very near-death experience in her family, one of her close family members, and the church earnestly prayed and that person was delivered. She had three just fantastic stories that she came and told me last week and I said, Helga, would you tell them next week? She said, I'd be delighted to. So hopefully we can hear those testimonies some other time. But I also want to say that that is not, that does not mean that, that the recipe for God to be obliged to do whatever we ask is earnest, fervent prayer. The most earnest church prayer that I've ever been involved with was when we lived in Guelph and our three kids went to a Christian school and there was a family in that Christian school of boys and their mom and dad were both doctors. They were in their early 40s. We'd gotten to know mom and dad quite well. They weren't in our church, but we, we knew them well. And they were on a summer vacation out west, I believe it was Alberta, and they were swimming in a river and dad happened to have some open sores and the river evidently had some beaver urine in it and he got an infection that put him on a deathbed. And because he was a doctor and well-known, specialists were flown in from all over Canada to rescue him. And while the medical profession was working hard at saving his life, his church gathered for nightly prayer. And anyone who was, wanted to come was welcome. And I remember the night I came and that house was filled with people and we were on our knees and on our faces, earnestly begging God, for Rainy, for Haney Rafla, for his life to be spared. Well, that so moved me that that Friday night, Karen and I agreed, we took our youth group out of the church building and we went to the Rafla's house and we gathered all around their front yard and we prayed for a long time, earnest, fervent prayer. And two weeks later, we were at Haney's funeral. God said no. Even though there was earnest prayer. God said no, I have a purpose that's higher and I don't need to explain it to you now. The sovereign government of God. Now, I ask myself the question, would I do it again in a similar situation? You bet I would. 100% for sure I would. Will prayer change a sovereign God's mind? And the answer is likely no. But will prayer often be a part of a sovereign God's unfolding plan? And the, and the answer from Scripture is yes. Yes, we, we do not know how that plan will unfold, but very often in Scripture, prayer is a big part of it. So I'll end this message today with a few takeaways about prayer after we look at more of this intriguing story, okay? So verse six, the night before Herod was to bring him to, to trial. So he's about to die the next day. Look what it says, Peter was sleeping. Of course he was. It's Peter, it's Peter. <laughs> they, Peter's like water off a duck's back, right? Just whatever, whatever comes. Now Peter, Peter either had a perpetual prescription for Ambien or he had the spiritual gift of sleep. Because there's at least three occasions in the Bible where Peter's sleeping. Like really significant occasions. On the Mount of Transfiguration, 
in Luke chapter 9, Jesus pulls back the veil, reveals himself in glory. There's Elijah, there's Moses, and there's Peter sleeping. <laughs> he nearly missed the transfiguration of Jesus. Nearly. They woke him up. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew 26, Jesus even asked Peter, would you watch and pray? Can you imagine if Jesus asked you to watch and pray? And he's predicted, I'm going to die tomorrow. Would you not stay awake somehow, some way? Not Peter. No, he tried. But he slept because he has the gift of sleep or something. And so here he is on death row the night before he's going to be executed. Put yourself in his sandals. Could you sleep? Could you sleep? I mean, how could he sleep? And notice the setting between two soldiers chained with two chains. In the visual Bible clip, they're all sleeping. I kind of doubt it. Those guards knew that if their prisoner escaped, whatever the sentence is, is theirs. They were probably wide-eyed alert. But nevertheless, can you imagine if they're all sleeping, the sounds of their snoring and the smells? And I speak from experience having been at many men's retreats. <laughs> I would say it's 50-50 for ever sleeping through the whole night because of the sights and sounds. Some of the women are like, TMI, I do not need to know all this information. But it's true. How is Peter sound asleep? Well, it's partly because Peter was obviously a sound sleeper, but it is mostly because of a promise from Jesus. You say, what? A promise from Jesus? Yes. These are the words of Jesus directly to Peter in John 21. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. What is the one word here? that was better than Ambien to Peter in this situation the night before his execution. One word, three letters. Old. Jesus promised Peter he'd be old. And he's like, I'm in my mid-30s. I'm not old. Now there's some younger folks here today and they're like, 35 is old. It's, listen, 65 is the new 35, okay? Or something like that. I've, I've heard it's something like that. But Peter is not old. And he, Jesus promised him he'd be old. And so he's like, I'm not dying tomorrow. I'm sleeping tonight. <laughs> Amazing. Jesus' promise to Peter is like having Jesus' presence with him. It is his living word that Peter has. And because of Jesus' promise, Peter has peace. Listen. If Jesus is your Savior, if you have invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life, the King of your life, the Savior of your life, if you've invited him in, then the Spirit of Jesus is inside of you at all times, in all circumstances, and you ultimately have nothing to worry about. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Even dying, like James, means you beat everyone home to heaven. That's what it means. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Paul actually said, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, sovereign God says, I'm here for a while. J. Oswald Sanders said this, peace is not the absence of trouble, it is the presence of God. That's what peace is. Not the absence of trouble. And you know, we get tested on this. I got tested on this message yesterday with our daughter who was here last week, very, very pregnant. And she waddled out. Maybe some of you saw her. Well, they had to induce labor yesterday for, for a significant reason. And you say, well, did the baby come? Maybe. Parental permission dictates the updates. So if you keep it a secret, I'll let you know by the end of the message, okay? All right, okay. Years later, though, years later, Peter himself would write what he proved throughout his life to be true. In 1 Peter 5, 7, he said, cast all your anxiety upon him 
because he cares for you. Do you know that we can do that? I had to do that yesterday. I had to cast my anxiety upon the Lord because I knew he cared for me. And a sovereign God will do as he will, and I am okay with that. Verse 7. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. Did you notice throughout Scripture that angels rarely use doors? Rarely. They just appear. They just appear. But notice this. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. I so wanted the visual Bible to show us what that looked like. Because no one knows exactly what the meaning of that word struck is. And the reason is, it is often used in the Bible. Sometimes it's a light tap. Sometimes it's a strong blow. In fact, the word used of Peter striking the servant of the high priest's ear and cutting it off is the same word. <laughs> that word, no light tap. Right? In verse 23 of our text, when it says that the angel struck Herod down that he died, same word. Is that the kind of strike that Peter got? Like, I want to know. Did he get a kick? Did he get a slap? Did he get a pat? We don't know. But here's what I do know. If I had a choice between a tap from an angel or a blow from an angel, I'll take a tap, please. And what would distinguish which we would get? Well, the distinction is, are you fighting God or not? Herod was opposed to God, and he got a, a blow. Peter was working with God, and he maybe got a tap. I'll take a tap. I'd rather work with God than be opposed to him. But you know, in this scene, I'm picturing a parent. I'm picturing a parent trying to wake up their teenager on a Saturday morning anytime before 10 a.m. You know what we used to do? Literally, we'd open the door and send in the dog. That's how we woke our kids up. But, but imagine an angel waking you up, shaking you, striking you, whatever. Pretty amazing, right? Actually, Karen has woken me up many times, so I have been woken up by an angel. But the angel says, yeah, that was corny on purpose. The angel says, quick, get up. Now, why do you think he said that? Maybe he only gave a five-minute ambient to the, the guards. We don't know why there was this, this need for, for haste, but quick, get up. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Now, verse 8, there is pure humor here. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals. Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told. It's a bit like a parent telling their little kid to get dressed. Put on your clothes, now your sandals, and now your jacket. That's kind of what it's like. But not only that, the word sandals. I still remember Jack Hunter from Scotland talking about this. There are three or four kinds of sandals that were worn at the time of Jesus and of Paul. And the word used here is kind of the loudest form of sandal you could have. <laughs> I'm picturing Dutch wooden shoes. And I wouldn't put it past Peter. He's just that kind of guy, right? <laughs> Clogging around <laughs> town. And so he's clip-clopping down the hallway of the prison, trying to sneak out quietly. <laughs> That's the word for sandals here. But all four of the guards are out like a light, right? I've never understood that expression. Kind of a broken light, I think. But they're out cold. They're out cold. I think there's a lesson here, though. God does the extraordinary, but he expects of us to do the ordinary. Right? He's doing the extraordinary. He's pulling off the miracle. But he wants us to participate in any way that we can. And he challenges us to do the ordinary. You say, I want to be more like Jesus. Do it to me, God. Well, he will, but he wants us to pick up a Bible and read it and study it. And he wants us to talk to him in prayer. And he wants us to witness for him, because that's what we are. And he wants us to be in community with other believers. That's our part, and he does the extraordinary while we do the ordinary. Look at verse 9. Peter follows him out of the prison. <laughs> I love this. But he had no idea. He had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. Because Peter's had visions before. We saw that in Acts 10. But this was like the best vision or dream ever because he's being delivered from his execution. Verse 10, they passed the first and second guards. 
and came to the iron gate leading to the city. Notice this, it opened for them, see the words by itself? It's one Greek word, automate. <laughs> what does that sound like? Automate, automatically the prison doors open. I think these are the first automated prison doors ever. <laughs> I've done prison ministry and not because I was an inmate, but from the outside I would visit. And I remember the first time, I remember still distinctly at Guelph Correctional Institute. Not a lot of correctioning went on there, but um, uh, I remember I you know, had the, the first interaction with the guard, but then wherever I went from then, it was just like Maxwell Smart. Have you ever seen Get Smart walking through the hallway and the doors open before? And you go through it and the doors open behind you. It's creepy as all get out because you know someone's watching you. You have no idea where they are. All automatic doors and they clang shut like really loud with that lock. You know you're in prison. But these doors open automatically, angelically, amazing. And they went through them and when they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Notice verse 11. Then Peter came to himself and he says, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches. What, a, what an expression. And everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. You know what I see here? Herod still had a title, but Peter now has a testimony. What are you living for? Are you living to build a title? To have a title? I achieved this. I own that. I have done this. I have a title. You know what's better? A testimony. Mm -hmm. To know without a doubt that the Lord did this in my life. Now, can God use the platform of your title? Yes. But not to go for that as your objective. To live, to know Jesus in your life, that I may know him. To have a testimony. Peter knows what's up here. He knows that it was an angel and that the angel was sent by Jesus, the <laughs> sovereign Lord. Now, there's a lesson here in this rescue mission, and it is this. A child of God is invincible. Some theologians even say immortal until it's their time. A child of God is invincible until it's his or her time. Now, don't go out and test that by doing something reckless and stupid, because you know what? It will be your time now. It will be your time now. And I remember Jack Hunter again back in the day, he told two near-death experiences in his own life. I've definitely had one. Maybe there's been others, but I just, I don't recall them, but I, I remember when I was 18 or 19 years old, and I was on a, a street motorcycle. I'd been riding dirt bikes for about five years, so I, I, I'd slipped around quite a bit in the dirt, but never on the road. And I come cresting a hill on a highway, going about 85 kilometers an hour, and there was a truck backed right into my lane as I came over that hill. And I hit the brakes, and if you know anything about bikes, the rear brake is your foot. And now they're actually connected front and back, but, but at the time it was just the back. Well, of course, I hit it harder, and so I started sliding. And I, I could tell in a split second, I'm sliding either into the truck or under that truck. And there was no other option. I let off the brake, and I just millimeters got around the side of him. But if there had been a car coming, he'd be absent from this body and present with the Lord. And there's only one reason I didn't die at that moment, because it was not my time in the sovereign government of God. Job 14 verse 5 says, A person's days are determined. You have declared the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. The New Living Version says, um, You have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live, and we are not given a minute longer. The length of your life and mine is God's call. It's God's call. Now, can I say this? A number of us have journeyed with people who have had seasons when they've threatened self-harm. And you want to provide the very best help possible for them. Absolutely. But when they're maybe well enough to receive it, share the gospel that God is sovereign 
and he is the author of life and of death. We are not, but he is. It's just a part of understanding God's sovereignty. Look at Psalm 90, verse 12. Uh, Teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Again, the New Living Translation, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. And whenever I hear that scripture, I off, my mind immediately goes to Alfred Nobel. You know the Nobel Peace Prize? Uh, when Alfred Nobel was an older man, one day he opened up the newspaper and there was an announcement of his death the day before. It was mistaken. It was his older brother who had died, but it said that he had died. And literally, this is what it said. Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite, who died yesterday, devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than ever before, and he died a very rich man. And that shook Alfred to his core. That that was his legacy on earth, that he had been the creator of dynamite, that blew up more people and would blow up more people in war than anyone else and was made rich by it. And he, in a very short time, instituted the Nobel Peace Prize and spent the rest of his days working toward peace. And this is what he said later. He said, every man and woman ought to have the chance to correct his epitaph in midstream and write a new one. And that's what happens when we realize the brevity of our life so that we might apply ourselves to wisdom. Well, Peter here is grateful with excitement. He can't wait to be with his church family. Look at verse 12. When this had dawned on him, that he'd been delivered by the angel, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people were gathered and were praying. And this is the Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Evidently, Peter and Mark were good friends, and probably Mark got a lot of his source material from Peter. Well, we know what happens. This girl named Rhoda answers the door. And her name actually means Rose. So Rose or Rhoda answers the door. And this is a hilarious scene in verse 14. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Can you hear Peter saying, Rose, get back here. (laughs) Where are you going? Please let me in. But then this response of these Faith-filled prayers here. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. Because, of course, angels always knock on doors, don't they? No, they don't. They just appear. So what is this? What is happening here? Well, many theologians think that they're, they are referring to Peter's guardian angel, who they likely believe carried him off to heaven. So they think Peter's angel has shown up at the door and is knocking instead of just walking in. But can we learn a lesson from their response? You're out of your mind. Don't interrupt our prayer meeting with an answer to our prayer. You're out of your mind. (laughs) Have you and I ever done that? I don't know about you, but I sure have. God could never cure this person even though I'm praying for him or I'm praying for her, but he could. God could never save this marriage, even though we're praying for it, but he could. God could never rescue that person. They're so far gone, so far away from God, but he could. God could never restore this person back into a a strong, faith-filled relationship with Jesus, even though we've been praying for it, but he could. What holds us back from praying those kinds of prayers? I'm going to conclude with that. I really am. I'm going to conclude with that. But notice again the text. But Peter kept on knocking. I said this last time. Peter's standing at the door thinking, it was easier to break out of a Roman prison than to break into a Christian prayer meeting. (laughs) What is going on here? Right? There's something wrong with this picture. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. I actually like this response. I think it's okay to be astonished when God does things. Because when we wonder, we worship. If we cease to wonder, we will cease to worship. And so they're astonished. I loved what one commentary said. It was an angel that got Peter, but it was prayer that got the angel. 
It was an angel that got Peter, but it was prayer that got the angel. And that's pretty astonishing. So Peter motions with his hands. He recounts the story. But notice this tender statement here. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about it. What's he saying? He's saying, go tell the family. Go tell the family. The church is my family. My brothers and sisters. Now you say, wait a minute, James. Does Peter not know that James has been executed? This is a different James. It's literally James, the half-brother of Jesus, not the brother of, of uh, John. Okay, and so this James would literally become a replacement later, uh, leader for his namesake who died earlier. And we're going to see this James appear in Acts 15. Verse 18, in the morning there was no small commotion. That's another way of saying there was a big commotion, right? <laughs> there was a big commotion. Why? Because Peter's missing. After Herod had made a thorough search, did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered they be executed. Isn't it sad that Herod was so much like his murderous grandfather that we talked about last time? Innocent James dies. Now these four guards all caught up in this vortex of evil. Well, verse 20 talks about the story of, you know, Herod being at odds with these people in Tyre and Sidon. So look at verse 21. <clears throat> at the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robe, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. There is a Jewish historian who worked for the Romans and wrote for the Romans named Josephus. And this is one of the stories that he tells with a lot of detail. In fact, this um, royal robes that he's wearing, he describes it in, in, in technicolor. It's really, really fascinating. They shouted, this is the voice of a god, not of a man. You know, I have never heard those words after I speak on a Sunday. <laughs> never. Never. I'm surprised by that. Actually, I'm really glad by that because it might go to my head and I'd be eaten by worms. So I'm glad that's never been said. And if you say it to me today, I'll know what you really want. Okay. <laughs> Verse 23. Immediately, what a striking text. Immediately because Herod did not give praise to God. Does that make you tremble just a bit? I have at times not given praise to God. I am thankful that in the government of God, this has not happened to me. It could. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord, our word here, struck him, and he was eaten by worms and died. Now again, Josephus tells this story. And he tells how he was struck immediately with pain and died five agonizing days later. And medical people have speculated that it was likely a cyst caused by a tapeworm that ruptured or burst. Very nasty, but it's not unusual in sheep growing countries to this day. And so that's likely what happened. So he was struck immediately and he died five days later. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish and then the setup for the next chapter, Barnabas and Saul finish their mission. They return from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Let's close by looking at some what I call prayer practices and preventatives. Okay? So by practices, I mean ideas that will help us to pray more. And that's a positive thing. We want to be a praying church. But preventatives, meaning issues that, that will cause us to pray less. And that's not a positive thing. And, and we're going to take a look at them um, one by one, but together. Okay, so first the preventative, but then here's a practice that will remedy the problem. Now, they're all serious preventatives to prayer, but this first one might be the most serious because I think it's the root issue. And I got to tell you, I do not enjoy this role. <laughs> sharing these things, because I, I know you're not going to be happy with me after I say this, but I say this because I know me, and I know what my journey has been with prayer. And so the first reason we don't pray is pride. It's pride. I don't need to pray. I can fix my fill-in-the-blank. 
I can fix my broken relationship. I can fix my finances. I can fix my anger issue. I can fix my, my porn addiction. I can fix whatever it is. Now, I hear someone saying, you know what? Pride's not my problem, actually. My issue is laziness. Well, what if they're connected? What if they're connected? What if the reason you're lazy about praying is that you don't realize how much you need to pray? You say, that's not laziness. That's ignorance. Ignorance. What if laziness and ignorance are connected to pride? <laughs> you say, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm listening. Okay, scenario. What if right now God said to you, I'm cutting off your oxygen for the next 10 minutes. Get your own oxygen. Seriously, would you call out to God? I know with whatever oxygen I had left, I would call out to God for oxygen. I pretty much take oxygen for granted. But I don't realize how much I need God for oxygen. Another scenario, the test results have come in for your mom, for your dad, for your sibling, for your child. And they're not good. It's really bad, actually. We can make them comfortable, nothing more. Seriously, if you got that diagnosis, would you call out to God? You lose your job tomorrow. Would you call out to God? Would you pray? See, in our neglect, in our neglect around how much God does for us, we don't pray. At the very least, every day we could be thanking God for his many gifts. It's called the practice of gratitude. The practice of gratitude. Instead of focusing on self, think of all the things God has done for you and for others in your life. See, pride has been called the worst of all sins because by it we are blinded to all other sins, including our shortcomings, our laziness, the Bible calls sloth, our willful ignorance. What does sin mean? It means missing the mark. We miss the mark all the time. So make your focus God. And, and here's God's challenge to us in 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice always. Pray continually. How do we do that? Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you. This is God's will for you. In Christ Jesus. So preventative pride. Practice gratitude. Second prayer preventative. Sin. <laughs> you say, didn't you cover it with pride? No. Sin. I don't want to change some things in my life. So I don't want to talk to God about them. I think that's, that's an issue with a lot of people. I don't want him to change my lust issue. I don't want him to change the idols that I have in my life. My business that I haven't been honoring God with. My finances that I haven't been honoring God with. I don't want him to mess with those things. My independence, my laziness, my ignorance, my pride. Is God prompting you to start praying? Here's how he would prompt you. Because he prompts me this, this way. Repent of sin and receive forgiveness. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Repent of those sins and receive what Jesus has done in forgiving you on the cross. This is a prayer practice. In fact, many of us have heard this text, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, but actually I'm gonna reframe it on the screen. Look at it this way. If my people who are called by my name, are you his people? Have you been called by his name? Do you know that he's received you as, your as his child and you're, he's your Lord? If that transaction has happened, look what he says. He says, there's four things I want from you and there's three things I'll do for you. If my people called by my name will, one, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, that's repentance, from their wicked ways. Then I will do these three things. I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. I will heal what is wrong. What is broken. I will step in. I will heal. And often those are hard issues. Right? Deep, deep issues. Well, sin. 
I, I could say so much more about these. I have, I have two more on either side. Third, prayer preventative, doubt. Doubt. M maybe even disbelief would be the, the term. And it's rooted in disappointment often. Maybe the church, listen, maybe the church did earnestly pray for James. And they believe God could have saved him, but he died. Now, they could have been filled with doubt and disappointment because of that and not prayed for Peter. Evidently, they were not. And so they went ahead. We earnestly prayed for our friend, Haney Rafla, but he died. And I don't know, but some of those people maybe have given up in disappointment to pray that way for people. I don't know that. Maybe you have earnestly prayed about people's health and they didn't get well or finances, or struggles, or needs, and you're like, no mas, no more. I'm not praying that way anymore. What is the root issue there? I've checked my own heart. The root issue is this feeling, this fear, that I'm not worthy of God hearing me. Is that true? Are you not worthy of God hearing you? Does the gospel say that? It does not. Are you feeling, are you afraid that God doesn't love you enough? to answer your prayer, to hear you even. Well, that's not true. That's not the gospel. What is the answer to doubt? Now, some people would say that the answer is faith. Faith. And in some respects, that's true. But faith in what? Faith in what? Did the church have faith that God could rescue James? Of course they did. But he died. Did the church have more faith that God could rescue Peter? And is that why he lived? No. James didn't die and Peter didn't live because the church had or didn't have enough faith. There is a camp called the faith movement who say that if you just have enough faith, you can name it and claim it. Those are their words. You can blab it and grab it. You can sneeze it and seize it, like whatever. You can just put it out there and God's obliged to answer your prayer. It's a lie. Faith in what? In God and his power, ability, wisdom, sovereignty. In his sovereignty. God, you do what you will because you are God and I am not. And you don't have to explain your higher purpose to me. So the prayer practice to dig into is the truth about God. The truth about his sovereignty, power, and ability. And the truth about what God says about you. That's the antidote to doubt. Pray the gospel. And fourth and last preventative, there's so many more, but it's this. I just don't know how to pray. What prevents me from prayer is I do not know how to pray. And the practice that overcomes that preventative is strikingly simple. Just talk to God. Just talk to God. James 4 and 2 says, you do, not, you do not have because you do not ask God. He puts it right on the, the bottom shelf there. And he goes on to talk about right motives and so on. But I think the most common thing that I've heard from my son and his wife to our eldest two grandchildren is this. Use your words. Use your words. Right? Don't you parents say that to your kids? Use your words. That's what God says to us. The heavenly dad says, Use your words. Don't complain to everyone else or to yourself in your theater of your mind. Talk to me. Talk to me. And practically speaking, Jesus gave us this pattern prayer. Prayer. I, I love to pray it over three families every day from Matthew 6, 9 to 13, the Lord's Prayer. It's a pattern prayer for us. It gives us language. And, and here's, in closing, here's a wonderful opportunity for you and I to experience prayer in community together. It's called five weeks of prayer. Actually, check that. It's called five weeks of earnest prayer. Earnest prayer. That's what the conveners would like it to be called. Praying every day about whatever need there is. And I know there is a number of you who have ministry opportunities that you're praying about right now. Bring that to the prayer meeting. And our potential merger. We want that to be a big focus of earnest prayer for five weeks. To say, God, what do you as a sovereign God want for our churches? 
Not my will, but yours be done. Meeting for prayer every Wednesday at 7.30 throughout the month of September. And we have an address even. Meeting at 68 Locust Street in Kitchener. Brooke and Helen, do you know anyone who lives there? Yeah, okay, they, they live there. Okay, okay. Now you say, wait a minute, September only has four Wednesdays. Well, along with Brooke and Helen, we thought that August 31st is close enough to September, we'll start that. So this coming Wednesday is the first of five Wednesdays in September. Can you join us? Will you join us? 60, if you take a screenshot of that. William Cowper said this, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon their knees. I believe that. I believe that. Let's pray. Holy God, you said that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you, Jesus Christ, are Lord to the glory of God the Father. Herod is going to bow and say that. Haman is going to bow and say that. Hitler is going to bow and say that. Every single being on earth will bow and say that Jesus is Lord. All kings, all presidents, all prime ministers, every one of us, may we do it now. May we say, Jesus, you are Lord. Be the Lord of my life. Father, for anyone here who has never done that, may this be the day when they acknowledge I am the sinful person that Jesus died for on the cross and I receive his forgiveness and I, I invite him to be my Lord. And for those who have known him for many days or a long time, may we declare again, Jesus, you are my sovereign Lord. Have your way in me. May I learn how to walk with you anew. Pray in Jesus' name.